I think we may as well just finish this up today, which would be awesome. Okay, so we've been talking about, we've been de talking about type systems generally, and more specifically, we've been talking about what are the different components of a type system and what makes up a type system. So we've seen different ways to actually create new types, right? So we're defining this very simple type system that has pointers, structs, arrays with ranges and functions, right? Very simple. So now the question is, how do we actually use type constructors? So we briefly touched on it a little bit. Somebody remind us, why do we want to declare new types? Yeah? We need to create potentially new objects and new sort of definitions for an extension of the objects. Yeah, so we may want to create in, and basically model in our program in some way some new type of object. For instance, arrays, right? We could, we want to have arrays because we want to have items in a list, and so the type system allows us to define that. We also might want to have pointers to things. We also might want to use structures so we can group things together, all this kind of stuff. So in our language, we're going to declare types similar to this. So this is declaring a new type centimeter, or just cm, right, which is defined as an integer, right? Here we go with that. New name on the left, the type that is defined, that this type is defined as is on the right. Cool. We can also define things like RGBA. So what does RGBA stand for? Red, green, blue, and Adam? Alpha, what is alpha for? Yeah, opacity, transparency, right? So that would be another number that can tell you how uh, much you can see through that pixel, right? So this is one way to represent a color channel, right? And we're saying like it's an array from, let's see, zero to four, is that the way we want to do it? Of integers. So we're saying the type of the array, so we're saying it can be technically five elements, which we'll change real quick. Look at that. Just in time compilation of slots. So four, we have zero, one, two, three right, elements here in our array. And they'll each stand for, in this definition, red, green, blue, and alpha. Right? So then we had an array of 256 by 256 of RGBAs. There we now have an array of array of arrays which could define a 256 by 256 pixel picture, right? And But we, we could do that just by using the arrays, right? So remember, one of the important things is we could do whatever we want to do just by using this array 0 to 3 of ints, but giving a name to what this is gives our program more semantic meaning, and it helps us later and other people who follow us when they try to maintain this code to say, oh, I know what this means. I know what RGBA means. This isn't just some array of, random array of four elements. This is a very specific thing that the programmer wanted. And it helps the type system allow us, uh, help the type system to catch, uh, to catch errors, right? So if we ever try to pass an RGBA somewhere where it doesn't belong, the type system will be able to tell us. Cool. And yeah, so here we go. We can make a PNG. Uh, this would be just a 256. So you need some extra information to say what's the width, what's the height of the object, all of that. So important things are I'm building these complex types. I'm using type constructors by using references to other defined types. Right? So here I'm building an array out of a defined type that is not a basic type. This type is defined here. Okay. Do all these new types. So Specifically, when I make a type declaration like this, what am I doing? Yes, I'm giving this specific type on the right, I'm giving it a name. Right? That is what I'm doing. I'm saying from here on out, whenever you see centimeter, think integer. We'll see exactly what that means later. I'm being kind of vague. But we're essentially defining this name. Now the question is, if I were to cover up with uh, something that doesn't exist, is that I could do this on here? Probably not. Right? Does 
this type on the right, so is the thing on the right here, array 0 through 3 of int, is that a type? Yeah, right? It has to be. I'm declaring a new type called RGBA, which ha has this type. Now the question is, what is the name of that type? So let's think of the first one. Is integer a type? To be consistent. Is it int a type? Yes. Now it is yes. Does it have a name? Yes. Yeah. Int. Right? That's its name. Does array 0 through 3 of int have a name? This type is an array of 0 through 3 composed of integers. And here we're specifically saying this type declaration, we're giving that type a name. We're saying RGBA is this array 0 through 3 of int. But unlike int here and here, we're even then using that name. right? We're using this RGBA name inside this type declaration. But the question is, does this have a name? before we've given it the name of RGBA? No, it doesn't, right? We're using our type constructors to create some new name, right? Just like, well, I'm trying to think if this is valid. Uh, just like you, well, okay, let's not go there. So this brings us to anonymous types. So in our language, and this actually often happens, this can happen in, in C, as we'll see in a second. We can declare variables. So here I'm declaring a variable x, just like the syntax we're used to, type variable. Here the type of x is an array 0 through 4 of int. So does x have a type? If you're the type system, does x have a type? It's an integer array. Yeah, it's an integer array 0 through 4. Does the, that type have a name? No. So what's the difference between See if this actually works. Hey, there we go. Right? Here we're declaring a new variable y and saying its type is RGBA. So what's the underlying type of RGBA? An array 0 through 3 of ints. But the key thing is, and we'll see why this is important later, but we're going to see when we try to say, can we set x equal to y or y equal to x, one of the factors that's going to come into play is the name. right? And so the important factor here is this is an anonymous type. There is no type here. right? You can think that, sorry, there is no name of this type. x has a type. It's very clearly defined here. But there's no name for that type. Here with y, Y has a type and has a name. Cool. Okay, so this is something that I, to be completely honest, did not realize until I taught this class. So when you're defining a struct in C, you have to add a semicolon after it, right? Isn't that super weird syntax-wise? Do you have to use a semicolon after you define a function? No, it seems kind of crazy, right? If you're trying to define some new type, why would you need a semicolon? Especially when you already have the braces, so it knows when the thing ends. It turns out the reason is because you can define variables that have that type. So you can actually define a list of variables, x, y, z, whatever you want, separated by commas, followed by a semicolon there. And so that's why you have to include a semicolon after a struct. So here I'm declaring a I have Y here. Yeah. This is what happens when you just make. This is a problem. You make local changes, then they have global consequences. Right? Here I'm defining a structure 
that has two fields, A and B, where A is an int and B is a character, right? And does that structure have a name? No. No, but I'm saying that there is a variable Z that has that type. Why might this be useful? is only used in one specific place, right? There's not really a good semantic name for it, and so you can have an anonymous structure like this. Cool. But the key part, especially when we get into things in two minutes, no name. It has no name. I'm going to keep saying this because it's going to take a while. No name. Has a type, has no name. What's the name if I said it has a name, you'd say it has no name. Okay. Okay, so now the question comes to type compatibility, right? So we talked about type systems. We talked about we need basic types, we need type constructors, we need type compatibility, and as we'll see in a second, type inference. Um, but that's so the question what type com compatibility tries to answer is which assignments are allowed by the type system. Right? And so here's where I want us to talk about this a little bit. So think about this. If you have an assignment A equals B. Right? We saw in semantics, we can tell you exactly what happens when we see A equals B. Right? Yes. Now the question is, does that make sense from the type system's perspective? So, let's say A is an int and B is a float. Would you want to allow this in your type system? You're the designer. Why or why not? Ooh, competing factions. Who says yes, they would like to allow this? Who says no, they would not like to allow this? Who is lodging a protest vote? Oh, I'm going to raise your hand. I was to trick you. It wouldn't be a protest if you end up voting. OK. Um, cool, so why? So some of the yeses. Why would you want to allow this? Ooh, so what does truncate mean? I don't know. Depends on how the guy who wrote the function decided to do it. Like cutting off the, the last Why do you need to truncate? Because integer cannot hold the form of number that Right, so we remember we talked about types and we talked about for each type there's a set of values that it can hold, right? So can int hold all the type, all the values that float can represent? No, right? Because the float has the decimal component. So typically what happens is we just, if we see this and we're to allow this, we want to cut it off. Why might we not want to do that? Well, not want to do that? Yeah, why would you maybe not want to do that? Who took the no side of this? Precision. Precision? What about precision? Um, what at what point might it different if you do it with a big number, like qualification? Yeah, right. What if it's 1.99 and you truncate to 1? Um, fundamentally, right, you as the programmer, if you're saying, hey, I have a float, I want to copy the value inside that float and copy it into an int, right, A, these types are not the same types, right, ints and floats are not the same types. So maybe an argument for disallowing it is saying, hey, maybe the programmer is making a mistake here, right, and I want to help them out. Maybe I want to then they need to make the decision, do I round the float to get an integer? Do I just truncate it? Right? The yes crowd is maybe, I don't know, has more faith in programmers, perhaps, and says, no, no, the programmer definitely knows in this huge specification document on C that when they assign a float to an integer, it's going to truncate it, and they definitely meant to do that, because that's what the language says. right? So, yes? Well, but if the programmer rocket crashes because they're an idiot, that's not the compiler designer's problem. But if you can prevent people from crashing rockets, don't you think you should use that power to do so? <laughs> yeah? This is business throw warning. Uh, throw a warning? So I think it would at least throw a warning, right? So that's kind of also your, your decisions as a language designer, right? Do you want it to be a warning? Do you want it to be an error? 
pro, it's pros and cons. I don't have any, you know, there's not any set in stone right answers, so things to think about, right? But different languages do this differently. What if A is a float and B is an int? Would you want to allow this or disallow this? And why? Allow it? Do you feel like the world's worst judge in this case? The past judgment on this? Why would you allow it? Yeah, right, we're not actually losing any information, although is that 100% true? I think it is. If b is 2 to the 32, will it? 2 to the 31 minus 1? Or if it's unsigned. Yeah, if it's unsigned, that could maybe cause some problems. Yeah. In that case, well here we know it's an int, so it's not an unsigned int, we'll say. Cool. So this is what type compatibility tries to answer. And we're going to look at three different strategies of ways you could design a type system that has different strategies for this. This is just one simple example. We get into a little bit more complex things. Uh, the fourth thing we talked about was type inference. So the question is, what are the types of expressions and other constructs? What is the result of that? So if you have an int plus a float, A, do you allow that operation? And B, what type does that return? Right? In most languages, it returns float. In some languages, it's not allowed, and you can't do it. Right? And so in C, so if we have A plus B, A is an int, B is a float, it's going to return a float in C. It's an error in ML-based languages, like o, uh, specifically OCaml is the one I remember this in, which, which can be really annoying as you're programming, right? It's like you have two numbers, you want to add them together. You don't want to be reminded that actually you have to change this int into a float and then use, I believe it may be a different, no, 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 it's a different operator. I don't know, it's been too long. But may, let's say the same operator should be easy. You still have to cast things. So a times b, right? If a is a string and b is an integer, would you want to allow this? And if so, what's the result? Yeah, I think I talked about this before. But in C, this is a clear error, right? You can't multiply a character string times an int. It doesn't make sense, right? But in Python, of course, it definitely makes sense. And it returns A repeated B number of times. The other thing you got to think of, why did this come up so often that they, I guess he, one person created this, thought that like this would be something really useful to have. I don't know. I mean, I don't, it, it's one of those weird things that once you know it's there, you kind of find ways to use it, but you never are like, in other languages, like you're in C or Java, you're not like, no, why can't I multiply this string by this integer? God, this language is so cumbersome. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you're doing ASCII pictures or something. But even then, you just write one function to do that. It's like the easiest function. Like, it doesn't have to be in the language itself. Especially as an operator, okay, that's not, I'm sorry, right there. <laughs> Okay, so now that we've talked about the four different aspects of a type system, we really need to dig in and talk about, okay, what are the different rules that people have tried to use for type compatibility? And this is principally about type equivalence. So how do we determine if two types are equal, right? If we see A equals B, when do we allow that and when do we disallow that, right? And we want this to be consistent. We don't want it to sometimes... You know, we want a standard rule and a standard way of thinking about this and determining this. So, in our language, if we have a type declaration of centimeter as an integer, we have an inch as an integer, we have a variable x that's declared as a centimeter, a variable y declares as an inch, the question really comes down to, and this is something we alluded to earlier, do we want to allow x equals y? Why or why not? And what would you use to tell the difference? Overload which operator? The equal sign? The assignment? Yeah. So overload operator to then do what? Actually, so there is, um, if you want to look at a language that actually does that, there's a language, uh, Scala, 
which is like a functional programming language that runs on the JVM, and they actually do that. So they will look and see if there's any functions that will translate, let's see, in, uh, in this case it would be an inch to a centimeter, and will automatically call that function in order to make the type system work. Uh, they also do a lot of really cool type systems uh, stuff in there, but so let's say we don't have that powerful of a type system. No, why not? I guess part of, partly depends on your perspective, right? Is our centimeters and inches the same thing? No. Are integers and integers the same thing? Yes. 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 So this is kind of where it, why it gets tricky, right? <laughs> the programmer has specifically said, I have centimeters here, a new type centimeters, and a new type inches, right? And so why would I want to allow an an inch just to be somehow converted to a centimeter, right? That doesn't make semantic sense. On the other hand, when you look at it more of the focus kind of maybe, uh, I don't know, engineering type way of looking at it, you say, well, they're both integers, right? They're both gonna be the same amount of storage. I can surely copy one to the other, right? And that's not gonna do anything. So this is really, comes down to the question of what do we do here? And so it depends on, we're gonna talk specifically about three different types of type compatibility rules. So the first one is name equivalent. So this is, you can think of the most strict form of type compatibility. So just from the name alone, how would you think, what do you think this goes by? The operator only works if both operands are all operands have the same Yes, the same name associated with the type. So would we be able to assign centimeters to inches? No, right? We'd have to pass it into some function that would take in centimeters and give us inches. Which in that case makes sense, right? That is really what we want to do. And then we can leverage the power of the type system to really help us do that. Um, so types must have the exact same name to be equivalent, right? We'd say error, can't do that. So let's think about this different case. We have Sorry, I just noticed this is the wrong way. It's not consistent with our earlier examples. There we go. Cool. So I'm declaring two arrays of 0 through 4 of A's and B's. So can I set A equals B with name equivalents? Yes. They do not have names. How could their names be equal if they don't have names? A lack of a name is not the same thing as having the same name. <laughs> you met someone and you both, I don't know, I guess maybe that doesn't make sense. We both like don't have first names. You're like, hey, we both have the same first name. No, you just don't have first names, right? Those would be not allowed under name equivalence. This is what trips people up. This is why I harp so much on the fact that anonymous types do not have names. Does this make sense? Do you, is this what you would want or expect from a programming language? Yeah. Yeah? Yes? No? Somebody? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, but in something like this, so how is this case different from the centimeter and the inches case? Is it the exact same situation? No. Are you saying that because I asked the question? And it's taking too long. Like, yes, yes, it's the same situation because obviously they're different types, but no, it's a different situation because there's no fundamental difference between ints and ints as there are between centimeters and inches. The data type is less of an abstraction, lower level, so it's the same, yeah. same concept. And we can apply that to anything. If you want to set an integer equal to a string, you just overload the operator to do the casting for you, so it's not as implicit. It's just data. It's just ones and zeros. Anything can be copied into anything else, whether or not it makes
makes sense. It shouldn't be the problem of the compiler designer. It's going to be the easiest way to build the compiler. Nobody will use it, but that is the downside, yes. You want to use something that people will use and will stop them from shooting themselves in the foot, but will not restrict them so much that they can't write programs in your language, right? So it's a fine line. If you think about all the possible programming languages that have been invented since computers came about, right? There's been a probably a large exploration of this design space. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, but would you? I mean, okay. So the question is, would you want to allow a equals b? Yes. Yeah. I mean, right from the information that we have here, in some sense, right? We have an array of zero through four of integers. And here we have an array 0 through 4 of integers. These kind of sound like the same thing. Right? I mean, because we have no additional knowledge, right? Part of the problem is the programmer did not give them a name, so we can't say that yes, they're the same thing, or no, they're not the same thing. Right? So you can think about name equivalence is very pessimistic and thinks you're very silly, the programmer, right? So things have to be, and if you think about it, this is also easier to code from the compiler's perspective, right? You just check names. Bam. That's it. Doing type system, type system done. Keep track of the names of types. The names don't match. The, the assignment operator is not valid. Cool. What about this case? Let's swap it around again. So here I'm declaring two variables, a and b, that are integers, arrays, 0 through 4 of ints. So now, can I set A equals B? So first, we have to think about before answering this question, what's different from this than the previous one? It's the exact same characters on the screen? Yeah. So A and B are declared on the same line, right? Which means they definitely have the same type, but will name equivalents allow this assignment? Why not? They don't have the same name because they don't have a name. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Right? Specifically not named. And now this is when this starts to break down, right? This really doesn't make as much sense. This is almost, I would think, too conservative and pessimistic. Because here, you are declaring two variables of the exact same type. Why would you not be able to assign one of them to the other just because they don't happen to have a name? I guess it's theoretically possible to do this and then use A and B as if they were two completely different types. But it'd be very bad practice, right? Actually, maybe that's a good reason why. Okay. But if I define type A as an array 0 through 4 of int, and I say A is an A and B is an A, then can I say A equals B? Yes, yes because they both have a name. That name is A. So, look at this. It's easy, right? Painless? This isn't so bad. Okay. Then we get to an internal name equivalent. So here, this takes, so takes name equivalent one little step further and does a slight tweak to it to uh, fix what is probably the most broken thing here. So the idea is now we're thinking about this from the compiler's perspective. And really, this is the downside I see of internal name equivalence, is now you have to think when you're programming what's the compiler going to do here. So the idea is the compiler has to give different names internally to the different types. Right? Whenever it sees an anonymous type, it can't just treat it as nothing. Right? It has to give it some name, even if it's some arbitrary random name that it never uses again. Does that make sense? It has to do that, right? It has to have some way to refer to it. And so, what we'll use is, we'll use this fact. We'll use, if the program interpreter gives the same internal name to two different variables, then they share the same type. So you can think that this is exactly like name equivalence, right? Because every, every type of the different external name is going to have the same internal name. Right? Otherwise, it's not going to work. The type system's not going to work. Where this comes into effect is in situations like this. 
right, where I'm declaring two variables a and b to be arrays 0 through 4 of integers. Right? Now, because these are happening on the same line, we know that the compiler will give them the same internal name. So we'd say, can we do, oh, and I would say C is an array 0 through 4. So we'd say, is A equal to B in under internal name equivalence? Yes. yes, because they have the same internal name. What about A equals C? No. No. Why? Now, the internal name is going to be different, right? This is a new anonymous type. It has no relation to the previous anonymous type except for the fact that it is the same underlying structure. Right? But name-wise, it's a brand new anonymous type that we've never seen before. So internally, the compiler is going to assign the same internal name to A and B and a different one to C. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Cool. So, the same as name equivalence, except for this one difference, which only comes up in anonymous types. Sweet. Okay. Then we go to the other end of the spectrum which says, well, I'll allow it if I can try to figure out that both of the types on the bottom have the same structure. I will allow that. Right? So if you have two types that are ultimately integers, you'll be able to assign them to each other and I'll allow it. Right? But the problem is then we become, what does it mean for two structures to be equivalent? They can hold the same type. And, what, and is that it? And how do you make sure it's the right ones and zeros? So would you want to do that? That's weird. So let's say I have a structure. say that these two structures are structurally equivalent. Why not? What if I change this? No, why not? Are they the same structure? Well, they're floats, right? I mean, sorry, one's an int and one is a float. Uh -huh. Right? So then what if I change this then to an int? Yes. Yes. What if I change it like this? Yes. Are they still structurally the same? Yes. Cool. What about now? No. Right? They do not have the same underlying structure. Cool. Uh, let's see. Ooh. Now this is the tricky one. Yes. Somebody make an argument for yes. Somebody make an argument for no. Right, 
So you're using your knowledge because you know in C, right, the way this is done is the first four bytes of this structure will be an int, and the next will be a string, which is a type that does not exist in C. And in B, the first, well, not the, yeah, the first four, the first byte will be the string, and then the last will be four bytes of an integer. Right? Therefore, it doesn't make sense to copy. They don't have the same structure if you just look at them bytes on the page. Um, let's change it around a little bit. What if I change it like this? Still no from that argument? What about yes? Yeah? Well, they still have the same space. Can be stuff for them. And you can put it any way you want. Yeah, they still have the same space. And we specifically know that they have even the same field names here, right? So then I know a foo here should maybe be the same thing as a foo here. Yeah. So if they were the other order and they were both string in, but one of the strings was a lot longer, arbitrarily longer than the other string, would it still cast because the size of the string or the size of a character array is based on how many characters there are in it before you get to the note? Uh, let's think that now these are kind of like C++ classes of strings. So it's just some object that we don't really care about the size. It's the string class itself will handle the allocation of size and everything. So it's not going to be inside the, uh, the structure itself. Or you think of it as like a pointer to a string. That would probably simplify that a bit more. Right. So one argument would be yes. What about, let's think through how those arguments go like this. Okay, so here, clear. Clearly, yes, they use the same structures. Now what happens if I do this? Mm, uh, I'm running out of random traversion. <laughs> Are these the same structurally equivalent? Some of you give me an argument for yes and for no. A yes argument? They have the same types, and what about those types? In the same order, so we know the structure is going to be the same. What would a no be? Explicit names, right? In a structure B, if I have some x and some y, that's z, so I say x equals a z, well, when I put, let's use this one, when I put set B's, uh, what is it, z, when I set z's cool to be something, does that mean the same thing as a's baz? So that's actually one of the key questions we have to ask is. What matters? Does it matter the order and the types of the types in the structure? Or does the field names of the structures and those types matter? So you can do it, I'll tell you, you can do it either as well. When I say you, I mean if you are doing structural equivalence and you are teaching this class, you can define it however, whichever way you want. In this class, as we'll see, we're going to specifically go in order of the types as they appear and ignore the names of the fields, yeah. How would you know the difference if you have like multiple hints in each one, but they all have different names? How would you So like, uh, if I had something like this, something like this, and then something like uh, the, I'm running out of, Something like that. So it's C and D, B. So one way you know is you know the size of each of these structures, right, of the things inside the structure. So you'd say the zeroth byte, so for struct C would be eight bytes, the zeroth byte to the fourth byte would be A, and the fourth byte to the eighth byte would be, wait, no, zero through three and four through eight? Yeah, whatever. You know, uh, would be a B. Right? So in this case, under what we're going with, yes, these would be structurally equivalent. Uh, does it depend? Um, whether it's just like a memory copy or whether it's seen for the type if you have seen a sense of it. Yeah, it could, it could.
could impact. We're going to do the straight copy semantics. We're just going to copy the value here over here. Cool. But we can't just define structural equivalence just for structures, right? We've defined, was it five different? Well, we'll see in a second. We've defined a bunch of different ways to construct new types. So we need to be able to tell when those types are compatible, right? So built-in types, right? Built-in types are structurally equivalent only to themselves. Makes sense, right? Remember, this is more restrictive than maybe a normal programming language. Here, we're not going to allow any conversions between ints to floats or anything like that. So we're going to say strictly built-in types. Built-in types are the same as built-in types. Cool. Pointers to structurally equivalent types are the same. Right? What does this mean? A pointer to an inch is the same thing as a pointer to a centimeter? If yes. If centimeters and, yeah. and if centimeters and inches are both defined as integers, right? Exactly. So if we have a type type centimeter, type inch. We can allow x equals y. Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah. We have int pointer a, float pointer b, and we say can a equals b. No, because they're pointers to different types, right? Because int, so we see pointer to int, and we see pointer to float, and we say are these two structurally equivalent? Well, they are if what they point to are structurally equivalent. And we say are is int structurally equivalent to float? No. Right? So here we have a recursive definition, right? We're saying two pointers are structurally equivalent if what they point to is structurally equivalent. Cool. Structures. So determining structure structural equivalence. So we have some structure S1, where we have fields X1 through XK, which have is that right? Types W1 through WK? Yes. Why does it feel weird? Yes, okay, perfect. That's cheap. Okay. We have structure two, which has field names y1, y2, all the way through yk, which each of those fields have types q1, q2, all the way through qk. So, just like we just talked about looking at structures, right? The way we're going to do structural equivalence is two structs are structurally equivalent if and only if each of the fields in order that they're declared are structurally equivalent. Right, so in this example, it's going to be, is W1 structurally equivalent to Q1? Right? Is W2 structurally equivalent to Q2? And so on, all the way through WK equals QK. What does it say about the size of the fields in each of the structures? Why? How does it say that? So the size of W1 should be equal to Q1? Uh, yes, because W1 should be structurally equivalent to Q1. What about the number of fields in ST1 and ST2? It should be negative. Why? Size of ST1 should be equal to size of ST2. Yeah, but how is that stated here? Or is it stated here? The K. The K, exactly. Right? So the point is this K, this subscript, is the same in both. Right? This is the key that says they have to have the same number. And of each of those numbers, each of those types in order has to be structurally equivalent as well. Right? So once again, this is a recursive definition, right? Because one of these, W1 or Q1, could be a structure. Right? And so how do we determine if those structures are structurally equivalent? Right? We apply this rule again. Cool. So we can have structure A which has a field lowercase a that's an int and field b which is a float. We can have a structure b which has field b which is an int and a which is a float. So if I have a and uh, if I have foo which is a type a and b bar the and bar which is a type b, can I set foo equal to bar based on structural equivalence? Yes. Yes. Could I do it based on uh, name equivalence? No. Internal name equivalence. Why? Why in both cases? Because they don't have the same name, and because there weren't any internal names. 
Yeah, they both have this different name, right? We have, we've named this type A and we've named this type B. Foo has a name, Foo's type has a name A, and Var's type has a name B, they are not the same. Cool. And because they're not the same, they have different internal names. Cool. Now if we switch it around and structure A has A as an int and B as a float, and B has B as a float and A as an int, and we have A equals B, can we set A equal to B? No, specifically because the order is not the same, right? We have int. So we say, okay, the k's, they have the same number of fields, but is int structurally equivalent to float? No. Cool. Arrays, so two arrays are going to be structurally equivalent if, what do you think? Same size. Same size and? Same type. Same type? What do we want to be true about their types? The types of the elements in the array. Yes, they should be structurally equivalent as well, right? So the range is the same number of dimensions, same number of entries in each dimension, which is a fancy way of saying the same. And T1 and T2 are structurally equivalent, right? Cool. Now, what about function structural equivalent? So we have two functions, t1 and t2. So what should be true about their number of parameters? Should be the same, right? That's with k. So what else should be the same? What was that? Right, type of t1 should be structural equivalent to t uh, v1. T2 should be structurally equivalent to t V2, all the way to TK should be structurally equivalent to VK. Yep. What about the return types? Yeah, they also need to be structurally equivalent, right? T needs to be structurally equivalent to V. Why do I care about structural equivalence of functions? Function what was that? Function pointers. Function pointers, yeah. So if I pass a function in as a parameter of a function, how do I know that it has the same type that that function is expecting, right? One way to think about it is, could I use that function in place of that parameter or that other function, right? So for all i from one to k, ti is structurally equivalent to vi, and t is structurally equivalent to v. Perfect. How are we doing on time? Oh, cool. Okay. Cool. So I can go over this so you can get some homework on it. Sweet. Okay. So the goal is to determine, right, for every pair of types in the program, if those types are structurally equivalent, right? And it seems pretty simple at first glance because we have five rules, right? And we can easily just keep applying these rules in order to, uh, in order, until we get to the base case, in which case we say, but the problem is how to handle the following case where we have type T1 is a structure Field A is an int, field P is a pointer to type T2. Type T2 is a structure with a field A and P of a pointer to T1. So what's going to happen when we try to compare these two structures? <coughs> right, we're going to get into an infinite loop. We're going to say, okay, these structures are structurally equivalent if and only if int is structurally equivalent to int. Is that true? Yeah. Yes. And the second case is if pointer to T2 is structurally equivalent to pointer to T1. How do we solve that? Yeah, pointers are only equivalent if what they point to is structurally equivalent. So these would be equivalent if T2 is structurally equivalent to T1. How do we say if, structurally, if T2 is structurally equivalent to T1? If int is structurally equivalent to int and if pointer to T2 is pointer to T1. So should we loop forever? What should we do? Are these the same? Yes? No? No? So, the way we get around this is 
we're going to first, just like we did, uh, similarly to how we did in uh, first and follow sets, where we started with empty first and follow sets that we could use. In this case, we're going to assume that all types are structurally equivalent. And we're going to go through and disprove that fact. Right? So here, if we start out by assuming T1 and T2 are structurally equivalent, then when we get to, is a pointer to T2 structurally equivalent to a pointer to T1, you'd say, yes, they are structurally equivalent. Cool. So this is the basic idea. We're going to create an n by n table. Uh, where n is the number of types in the program, each entry is either true or false. Uh, talked about this. The algorithm is actually pretty simple. We just set each entry to be true. While the table is not changed, we go through and check those types. And if they're not structurally equivalent, then we change it to false. If we've gone through all the pairs in our table and we haven't changed anything, just like first and follow sets, that means we've got no new information, so we're done. And we've decided the structural equivalence of every type in the program. Cool. Uh, so we can go through, eh. All right, I guess I'll do this on Wednesday. But there's an example in here. It's very easy. We, we'll go through it in class together on Wednesday. Did you get our exams back? Soon.